today as you have uh, asked for this is the newer procedures in strabismus surgery that i would be talking about as you know strabismus surgery has the objectives which we all know was initially just cosmesis personality development or diplopia correction but now more and more we realize it is the binocular vision restoration and the restoration of stereopsis the goal for ophthalmologist nerve is not just restoring 2020 vision or 6 by 3 vision with good near vision j1 in each eye but also to restore the stereopsis which is the prime thing that god has given us in uh, as human beings so we as strabismologists are not just treating strabismus but also restoring the binocular vision and stereopsis now this case study is of a child who was born as eyes having straight but around few th two or three months the father who was a renowned who is a renowned pediatric ophthalmologist and strabismologist in united states saw that his child was turning in so there was an esotropia he did a good cycloplegic refraction gave him the required glasses but as you can see there is still a left esotropia in spite of his regular wear of glasses so he was operated at 6 months of age to correct the squint so that the alignment was restored and so this child has developed normal stereopsis as an adult this is the story of dr kenneth wright's son and something which we need to learn from and do it for each and every child of our country the critical periods we need to remember for treatment is the cricket's rule of fours and sixes particularly we all want six so remember at six weeks we need to see that congenital cataracts are taken care of six months infantile esotropia should be seen and should be corrected in the first year of life six years should be the time limit for us to take care of any intermittent exotropia which is manifesting more than 50% of the times any nystagmus any refractive error or any impediment to binocular vision development how do we manage strabismus it can be non surgical or surgical primarily in this non surgical field we have a proper refraction and proper prescription which needs to be done amblyopia therapy needs to be done to correct the uh, binocular vision orthoptic exercises for any convergence insufficiency which is causing the manifestation of an intermittent exotropia or prisms may be sometimes used for small angles of deviation but finally we have to res uh, resort to the surgical uh, straightening of the eyes but mind you it's not like cataract that you see a cataract and jump for the surgery in strabismus spot diagnosis and spot management cannot be permitted or prisms may be sometimes used for small we need to have an observation confirmation inference planning and execution approach so what i suggest is this five prong strategy observe confirm infer plan and execute so that we can restore in every child what we want to have the striopsis just an observation is imp important to see that any squint which appears is not always a true squint there can be pseudo strabismus a pseudo esotropia or a pseudo exotropia and a simple thing can help cover confirm by a cover test that this is an apparent squint or a true squint we need to give a proper correction of glasses as is age appropriate and see that the eyes are straightened with it or there is a stellar residual esotropia or an exotropia for this we need to do a proper examination in which accommodative targets should be used so that the child is using his accommodation and the squint as you can see in the right hand picture is becoming obvious the moment he starts seeing an accommodative target we should use the prism bar to measure the deviations the hirschbergs can only be used for very small children but still we will have to refine it by other means and any glasses that the child is wearing if they are more than uh, the uh, about five diopters of power they will have an induced prismatic effect so we need to ensure that this is also taken into our uh, consideration and we correct for the amount of deviation when we measure through the thick glasses but mind you finally it comes to the inference and as we have in astrology there are 12 houses and which are being done the mischief by the nine planets we have a little difference here we have the nine houses the nine gazes and in this the 12 extraocular muscles are doing the mischief and they are so we when we see a case we will have to infer which muscle is the problem which is there and which needs to be corrected 
so we have these 12 extraocular muscles in the nine gazes which may cause an horizontal deviation a vertical deviation or a, even a torsional deviation as you can see that is the third dimension in which the eyes can have a freedom of movement or deviations so there may be a child who may be having straight eyes in the center on looking up it becomes divergent squint and on looking down it becomes a convergent squint in the same person as you can see here and this may be because there is a bilateral inferior oblique overaction so here we infer that we may have to do only the inferior oblique surgeries and that is what was done in this case we have executed the surgery and we got a correction of all the nine gazes as well as the hypertrophia in adduction in each eye so when we have such children who have a v pattern exotropia we look for the inferior oblique overactions look for their significance and but some cases may have a v pattern without inferior oblique overaction so you need to see in each case what is the situation the inferior oblique overaction may be different in the two eyes so there may be an asymmetry and we will have to do an asymmetric surgery accordingly similarly the superior oblique overactions may cause an a pattern like in this and there may be situation so whenever you have a patient who is having a, a horizontal deviation but having a v pattern we will have to look for any associated oblique overactions and if they are significant we will have to operate on them otherwise we may just do a vertical shifting of the horizontal recti to correct the a and b pattern the weakening procedures that we are going to talk about today are the recessions or it may be a hang back recession and sometimes we may do an adjustable surgery there may be a retroequatorial myopexy and very rarely a marginal myotomy strengthening procedures we have the resections more and more nowadays we are going to do a plication rarely we may do an advancement in resurgeries or a transposition of the extraocular muscles to restore the alignment how much surgery should i do will be the question there are nomograms which are there in all the books and you can use any of them to start with but you may have to change them according to your surgical effect and modify your surgical nomograms remember whenever we are operating in a child the safe limits are going to be much lesser than what we have for adults like in the medial rectus in adults we may operate 6 mm as the upper limit but in infant it may be just a 5.5 or even just a 5 mm and similarly the lateral rectus we will have to do because the extra ocular muscles are going to be changing the deviation differently when we are operating on a smaller globe compared to a larger globe the surgical instruments that we are going to use are these coming to the conjunctival incisions the most oldest one was the jemison's procedure uh, incision in which over the muscle incision was given this is now obsolete fornix incision is the one which we are mostly practicing that is a park incision the limbal incision may also be used in the resurgeries or for beginners and for obliques also we will use the park incision the paralimbal advised by swan and dr prem prakash is usually not done anymore recently there is a minimally invasive strabismus surgery incision which was initially described by gobin and uh, propagated by mojon but mind you this is something which i have tried and seen but i would not like to recommend the name may appear to be very interesting the miss but it's considering that it requires lot of learning and still there is a problem like this transconjunctival suturing technique that you will have to undergo and you may end up increasing the size and you require multiple small incisions to be made which may coalesce together moreover even mojon has suggested that you will have to do it only in the age group of between 14 and 40 because very young children there will be a problem of tenons and older people more than 40 the conjunctiva is friable and so it is not ad advisable so all said and done i would say that we will do the fornix incision technique that we will talk about so let's have a uh, under the microscope we are operating uh, the conjunctiva at the limbus has been held by an anchoring suture and a small nick is made 8 mm from the limbus first in the conjunctiva and then in the tenon's capsule so these two separate layers are incised separately and then we are going to pass this jemison's hook hugging against the sclera hooking the lateral rectus see that and now we will use the other hook that is the green hook 
the second part is now that the conjunctiva is covering the muscle we are going to reflect the conjunctiva gently so that we do not extend the conjunctival incision and bring the muscle into our focus of surgical field the intermuscular septum is given a small nick and we identify that full thick width of the muscle is in our hook if not we need to do that see that here at this step you can see the pole of the muscle which is there if this is not been done you would have uh, separated the muscle into two halves and now on the other side you have made a nick and then the check ligaments are given nicks all the time see that we are trying to maintain the sheath intact and prevent any bleeding which is undesirable 60 vicral sutures are going to be used a full thickness bite in the center is taken and a uh, knot is passed so this is the 60 vicral a full thickness bite taken and a knot is passed in the center and then two interlocking bites are taken at the two ends of the muscle and then we will disinsert the lateral rectus leaving a 0.5 mm stump so this disinsertion is done at this point you may give a light cautery because this is where the bleeding may occur and then you hold the stump of the muscle from the point where you are not going to use for measuring so when you are holding it in the center use the two poles for measurements here we have decided to do a 7.5 mm lateral rectus resection so this is marked with the gv paint gentian violet paint and this is the castro vigo calipers whenever we have larger than 8 mm we prefer a curved ruler or we may use a suture which has been marked because the cord length is different from the arc length now the spatulated needles are being passed to the partial thickness of the sclera now this is important because we do not want to have any perforation so this is how we bring the two ends of the suture and the knot will be passed so this is just for the beginning that we have said that we may use the uh, fornix incision and as you can see here we will pass the knot and this may appear little larger because for showing for the demonstration we have extended little bit but this will also collapse with just two 80 vicral sutures as shown here and this gives us a beautiful post operative comfort to the child and nowadays that's why we do not use any limbal incisions except for resurgeries for the strengthening rather than resection we are preferring to do a plication and i will just like to show you a technique of plication that now we are propagating as a reinforced plication now here again the anchoring suture have been passed and the conjunctiva the nick is given same as we had done for resection the muscle is hooked the needle rectus here and first with the gemisins and then the green soap intermuscular septum incised at the two ends the sheath of the muscle is maintained intact and now we have marked the gv paint 60 vicral sutures are passed and interlocking bites with two separate ends of sutures are used mind you we should have uh, more interlocking bites for resection or plication as we are going to tighten the muscle and it may slip if we do not take care of this now here we are not going to disinsert or cut the muscle as we do for resection but we i am going to just pass the needle ends just in front of the insertion of the needle rectus and then pass it back into the muscle this is a figure of eight bite that i have taken and this is what we will do for plication and now an iris repository is placed in between the muscle and the sutures and the muscle uh, is tightened with the help of these sutures so this is neatly double folded and this is a procedure that gives us as good results as for resection without disinsertion without the risk of slipping the muscle and also the possibility of doing an early undoing the surgery by 2 uh, 3 days or even a week so this is a new procedure and we would be uh, advocating that for strengthening the adjustable surgery a many times you need to do you may do it a two stage adjustment that is after the surgery 5 to 6 hours later you may adjust or you may do it the next day 24 hours you may also have an option of doing a sequential general anesthesia two uh, general anesthesia procedures and adjust them 
or a single stage adjustable suture surgery in which intraoperative adjustment is done uh, along with in the same sitting. Now this is how we are uh, doing the hemi hang back and the pa passage of sutures is there. I'll just show you a quick video of this procedure, the different strokes that we do for an adjustable surgery. You had seen the routine conventional recession. Now the, let's say we have marked it and the point where we would like to get the muscle, I'm marking it the same way as we did for the recession. But here the needle is passed, leaving a room for adjustment. That means we can move it forward. So, and these are radially passed a through a tunnel and then back into the insertion. This is a hemi hang back. And at the two ends, we have pa I am pa passing it. A silk suture is passed between the sclera and the first knot. And a one and a half knot vicryl knot is being placed here. We should ensure that the suture moves freely and see that through the tunnel, it can be done at the stage so that at the time of adjustment, you have no difficulty. So once we have done that, this one and a half knot is placed to secure till the time that we make an adjustment. This silk suture which is there is kept there and an anchoring bucket handle suture is being created here so that at the time of adjustment, I can easily hold the globe without resorting to a fixation forceps which may sometimes give way. So once this is done, the job is done and you can close the conjunctiva and after five hours, once the normal tension is restored, we can adjust the muscle. So these are the different types of adjustable procedure sutures that you can make. It may be a hemi hangback as shown in A, a full hangback as shown in B, or it may be the sliding noose technique that is propagated by some people. Now, coming to the COVID times, you are all now using masks. And just to give the comparison, the sliding noose technique is like the red colored straps in the mask. And the one and a half knot is like what you see on the white strap. Another procedure that we'll talk about is the near distance disparity and lateral incompetence when is there to manage. So when we have the same deviations for base, uh, distance and near, we call it a basic squint. But if it is having an ESO, which is more uh, esotropic for near, we call it a convergence excess esotropia. And an ESO, which is more for distance, is called a divergence insufficiency. Similarly, the EXO may be a basic, a divergence excess, or a convergence insufficiency type. There are some cases in which there is a lateral incompetence. That means on the side, the deviations are different. Now, we will have to manage these cases differently. A convergence excess esotropia, we can add a Farden or a posterior fixation suture over the recession and take care of this convergence excess. For the excess, which is for divergence, when the lateral rectus is to be similarly tackled, the Farden doesn't work good. So in these cases, a different approach is the combined resection and recession technique, which we are using for pre-op and post-op, as you can see, the deviations are different. And after the convergence excess surgery, like you see in this, we have done a, con a combined resection and recession of the lateral rectus. Similarly, as you had seen for recession, the same incision is made. The muscle is hooked and we have separated the lateral rectus. Now I'm marking the point of resection and the sutures are passed at this point. Let's say a five millimeter point has been desired to reject. So these vicryl sutures are placed and two interlocking bites are made. After this, I'm going to reject this part and recess the same muscle over and above so that I get the effect of the resection as well as recession, which will give me the effect of a pardon for divergence excess. Now, this is something which is interesting and was initially described by Alan Scott and also mentioned by Weekly as a procedure of an adjustable pardon. So here you may uh, do a 10 mm recession for the rejected five millimeters and you will get the desired effect of weakening the lateral lectures more for distance. And then you can close the conjunctiva. Coming to the obliques, remember, we are suggesting that you should avoid inferior oblique myectomies or the free superior oblique tenotomies. 
don't treat the obliques as wild animals and shoot them so that they are destroyed forever but rather tame them to become something which we can use for our future also now inferior oblique weakening procedures let us talk we are recommending doing either a recession or recession combined with anterior positioning the classical procedure described by fink is 6 and 6 mm from the lateral rectus inferior point mark and the pax is a point which is described as 2 and 3 mm from the inferior rectus temporal end the iliate and nankin procedure i'll just show you the videos of these in a time now remember when we are recessing along the course of the inferior oblique it is a pure recession but when i am positioning the inferior oblique anterior to the inferior rectus it gets anterior position and it starts acting differently now here the neurovascular bundle becomes the like an uh, origin functional origin and the insertion now if the inferior oblique is going to contract on looking up it will cause an anti elevation effect it will be working in tandem with the inferior rectus and does not allow the globe to roll up now this may be the required procedure for a dvd in very strong overactions of inferior oblique of 3 plus or 4 plus stagers anterior nasal transpositioning is a very good procedure which has been described by stager in 2003 and now we are usually using it for 3 plus or 4 plus inferior oblique overaction now this video shows you these weakening procedures that i just talked about now here uh, the same pax fornix incision is being used in the inferior temporal quadrant the conjunctiva is in size the tenens is in size and a little separation is made the lateral rectus is first hooked by the jemison's hook and then by the green hook now i use a lens hook or the graffes hook to retract the conjunctiva and show me the inferior oblique in the depth of this recess and use the jemison's hook to hook the inferior oblique as you can see the fleshy mass which is popping up now we need to be sure that all the inferior oblique by this white triangle that you just saw that entire width of the inferior oblique is in my hook unless this is done you may be leaving some posterior fibers and have a residual inferior oblique overaction the intramuscular septum behind and in between the lateral rectus and inferior oblique are incised and the muscle is disinserted under direct vision the sutures may not be passed prior the inferior oblique never gets lost and now once the assistant is holding with the forceps the sutures can be easily passed six zero vital sutures being passed here so central bite taken just like what i did for lateral rectus and two interlocking bites at the two ends and then the muscle is released the dismarge retractor is placed and now the inferior rectus is hooked the lateral rectus should be pulled up so that we are in the right place where we need to reinsert the inferior oblique that is at for the modified iliate nankin procedure i am passing it just at the lateral border of the inferior rectus that is the anterior end and now the dismarge is rotated little bit parallel to the lateral border of inferior rectus and the second suture is passed 5 mm more posterior as you can see in the inset the muscle will be positioned at 90 degrees to the inferior rectus now this is a very good procedure for 2 plus inferior oblique overaction and that's the most common procedure that we usually do for inferior oblique weakening be it for a superior oblique palsy or for a inferior oblique overaction the total anterior positioning which was described by elliot and nankin and from also pr propagated by mims jail mims is a procedure which we reserve for dissociated vertical deviations when we want an anti elevation effect because it is going to prevent the eye globe to roll up here what i am marking is just in front of the inferior rectus a point is marked and both the ends of the sutures are placed in this mark collapsing the inferior oblique just in front of the inferior rectus so this will now act as a segment of inferior rectus and cause an anti elevation this is a very good procedure for dvds and for uh, cases in which we want to restrict the movements of the eye to roll up 
Now coming to the third common procedure that we do is the anteronasal transposition of the inferior oblique. Now here, just the same way, I have let go the inferior oblique, let go the lateral rectus, and now the inferior rectus is being hooked, first by the, now with the green soup, and now the conjunctiva is reflected to show me the nasal part of the intermuscular septum of the inferior rectus. Now this intermuscular septum is separated. The inferior oblique is rolled over onto the nasal side, which nicely comes on this side. And a point is marked two millimeters nasal to the nasal point of the inferior rectus and two millimeters posterior. Now that is the point where I'm going to reinsert the inferior oblique. This is the stagers procedure and a very good procedure to correct any inferior oblique overaction of three plus or even four plus. Sometimes we may move it more nasal, but then it may cause an anti-elevation. So this is what is a very neat inferior oblique weakening procedure that anybody can do for a four plus inferior oblique correction and close the conjunctiva. Now, as you see in the fundus, the extorsion prior to the surgery and after the surgery, it has been corrected after the inferior oblique surgery. The Overaction which was causing a V pattern in up gaze and an inferior oblique overaction also gets corrected with this surgery. Coming to the superior obliques, remember the anatomy of the superior oblique and also remember it's a posterior fibers which cause abduction and depression and the anterior fibers actually are responsible for intorsion of the globe. What are the weakening procedures? The several procedures are listed here that uh, things which we are usually not recommending uh, have been crossed out with a uh, X in dark. The tenotomies, whether it's temporal or nasal, or tenectomies are nowadays not preferred to be done because they do not have the controlled procedure that we want. The Z or L tenotomy may, use, may be used sometimes, but the preferred superior oblique weakening procedure for mild to moderate superior oblique overaction may be the posterior tenectomy of superior oblique, which I'll show you. For more severe cases, we may use the hang loose loop tenotomies. Sometimes the silicon expander described by Kenneth Wright can be used. A translational recession is also a very good procedure to weaken the superior oblique. The other procedures which have been described are mentioned here, the differential recession of the anterior fibers or even the retroplacement of trochlea. Now these procedures are shown diagrammatically in this picture here, uh, the normal superior oblique in A and the other procedures have been shown here. Coming to the posterior tenectomy of superior oblique, you see diagrammatically here we are saving or uh, preserving the anterior fibers and removing the segment, trapezoid segment of the superior oblique, which is the posterior fibers. All the posterior fibers should be ensured in your uh, tenectomy that we are there. But here it is not a free tenotomy or tenectomy. The superior oblique fibers are still preserved in the anterior fibers. Now this is a video which is showing you how we do it. The superior rectus is being hooked first and the superior oblique is shown hooked. And these are the fibers of superior oblique that I have separated. As we go more nasal towards the superior rectus, the fan of the superior oblique is narrow and we can easily transect all the posterior fibers of the superior oblique easily. And we can bring this segment and show that all the fibers are uh, taken care of and then cut this trapezoid of superior oblique. You may pass your Desmans retractor or a tissue retractor to ensure that all the posterior fibers are indeed taken care of before you close. So it's a very simple procedure and takes care of overactions of superior oblique, which cause a pattern as is in this picture, this child having an a pattern with superior oblique overaction. And after this surgery, PTSO, the a pattern is corrected as well as the superior oblique overaction is corrected. For more severe overactions of superior oblique, we have done the translational recession of superior oblique. This is a translational point, which is 12 millimeters from the limbus and four to six millimeters from the nasal end of the superior rectus. And this procedure was initially described by Preto Diaz. But more commonly when there is a tight superior oblique as in the Brown syndrome, the uh, preferred technique of uh, me is nowadays the loop tenotomy of superior oblique. And you can see here, we are going to first do the exaggerated force duction test with the single forceps here. See how it goes freely, but in abduction, abduction it is not allowing. So the superior oblique in the infrotemporal quadrant 
the superior temporal quadrant i have made an incision the superior rectus is hooked and now the superior oblique is separated and disinserted again we are not passing sutures prior to disinsertion and we are just holding the superior oblique and the intermuscular septum on either side are given uh, incision and the superior oblique is held with the forceps here the 50 ethibond suture which is a non absorbable suture or you may use the mercelin suture is being passed we do the force reduction test again to ensure that all the fibers which were tight have been taken care of and pass these bites in the superior oblique insertion and this is the hang back that i would like to ensure that the superior oblique is lengthened see that so this is lengthened by 10 mm and intraoperatively i can do a force reduction test to see that it is enough or i may hang back more so this is a very good tailor made procedure for a uh, brown syndrome as you can see here how nicely the superior oblique movements have been corrected the expander described by kenneth right is another procedure which is done but uh, usually there is a problem that we are going to leave a silicon band procedure and it may sometimes give a problem of uh, extrusion so nowadays we do not do si silicon expander as much as the loop tenotomy for superior oblique strengthening the procedure of choice that we have is either a superior oblique tuck tenoplication or a modified harada ito procedure the modified harada ito is a selective strengthening procedure of the anterior fibers whereas the superior oblique tucking is for all the fibers of superior oblique as shown diagrammatically in this picture the superior oblique tucking as you can see here uh, has been nicely shown in uh, santiago and rosenbaum's book and you can see these we can do an intraoperative adjustment to see that we induce only a minor amount of uh, browns and do not cause too much of tightening of the superior oblique this is a pre op picture and the post op after the tuck being done for a superior oblique which was weak uh, bilateral superior oblique palsy is sometimes present to us and these have to be taken care of for the v eso that they have an extortion which is marked the uh these cases do well with the modified harado ito procedure as you can see here in this lady who had a bilateral superior oblique weakening and she has a v pattern eso in the down gaze the laxity of the superior oblique is not much so we prefer to do a harado ito procedure the superior rectus being hooked here and the superior oblique tendon is now being hooked now as you know this is we are doing a anterior fibers separation so the anterior half or one third of the fibers are taken separated till about 10 mm and 60 vital sutures are being passed at the end of the superior oblique we need to ensure that the sutures are well implicating the tendon otherwise it may cut through and now the muscle is going to be stretched the tendon is going to be stretched towards the lateral rectus 8 mm posterior to the lateral rectus this may be even done as an adjustable procedure and we may adjust by intraoperative adjustment or even a post operative adjustment the superior oblique is now being passed in the sclera 8 mm behind and this is how we are going to make it tighter as per our desire as far as the transposition procedures for six nerve palsies or other paralytic squints are concerned like uh, shown here so adjustable cross section partial vrt may be done and this is something that we are doing as a cross sectional procedure now this is what we had presented in jpos uh, in the uh, american association of pediatric ophthalmology strabismus and i am going to show you a small clipping of the partial vrt and the cross action vrts that we do this is the case in which we had a six nerve palsy this vertical rectus is being hooked here and we have separated the temporal fibers the 60 vital sutures are passed and we may do a resection effect if you want to have a little more tightening effect of the vertical rectus split portion 
and then the rejection is done. Now, at the point where we want to pass the lateral rectus insertion, this part is being restitched, and similarly, the inferior rectus segment will be attached. So this is the partial VRT. But when we want little more effect, then we do a cross-action VRT, which I will show you subsequently in this small clip. This is the cross-action VRT where the inferior rectus fibers are coming to the superior end and the superior rectus fibers are coming to the inferior end. And here there will be a more vectorization of the forces. As you can see here, the cross-action effect and we can put them on adjustable sutures so that we can have the desired result that we want. A recent procedure is the modified Nishida's procedure in which without disinserting the superior and the inferior rectus, we may pass the posterior fixation sutures to and get the torque in the desired uh, area that is weak. This is showing you the modified Nishida's procedure and this is the video which will just show you. So these inferior rectus, eight millimeters from the insertion is being marked and the five zero ethibond sutures are being passed here. We should ensure that the laser length is free and this uh, transfixation of the muscle is done very ni nicely. And then it is fixed to the sclera 13 millimeters from the limbus. So this is what I am marking 13 millimeters and passing the superior and the inferior rectus in similar manner in order to correct the weak muscle. So for the another procedure that we are uh, nowadays doing for third nerve palsies or synergistic divergence is the periosteum peri is the lateral rectus split into Y and then medially transposed. I would not show the video as a time constraint but another procedure for the third nerve palsy is the medial periosteal anchoring of the globe. Identify the misinnervation and transpose the misdirected muscle to the required site is what we are now suggesting as the targeted strabismus surgery. And finally, I would like to end my talk with two new procedures which have been described by Kenneth Wright, the mini tenotomy procedure and the mini plication. The mini tenotomy procedure is something which he is advocating for doing for very small amounts of deviation, which may be causing diplopia up to four or five prism diapters. And this is done under topical anesthesia, a transconjunctival grasp of the central muscle tendon being done. The mini tenotomy is done through the conjunctiva, cutting the muscle with the vest cause scissors as shown diagrammatically in these pictures. And post-operatively, you will get a three to four millimeter central cut, which will weaken the muscle in the uh, um, for about two to four prism diopters. Similarly, for tightening the muscle post operatively, when you find you need to do an extra effect, then you may do a mini plication. That means passing the sutures in the central part, four to five millimeters from the insertion site, taking a bite with the six zero vital sutures and bringing this part of the muscle as uh, in front of the insertion. And this will give a correction of about five to seven prism diopters. For nystagmus, the surgery that we are advocating nowadays is the augmented Anderson's procedure, similar to the recessions that I had shown you. But here we will do yoke muscle recessions of medial rectus 9 mm and lateral rectus 12 mm to correct the head posture of over 30 degrees. I would suggest that we have to be a squint intellectual. We need to examine our case properly, see what is the uh, causative muscles which are the problematic thing. And like in this girl, you see here, she was a third nerve palsy and identifying the correct muscles and correcting it, we are able to restore her movements, not only in the primary position, but with the help of the fixation duress procedure, even correct the dosis which was there, which was correctable. So this is how I would like to conclude my talk here. The goal, remember, is not just getting 2020, which has now become sort of an undesirable year. But for us, we, ophthalmologists, 2020 is still a respectable figure. We are not just interest, interested in getting 6 by 3 or 2020 vision, but we are restoring the stereopsis. 
we are not just doing squint surgery, but we are restoring stereopsis. That is what we have to remember. The pursuit of stereopsis is what was my talk for the NAP lecture for which I was invited in Vancouver by the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. And I had uh, and if you choose this to be part of Dr. Sharma's of all on behalf of the and the Asians, which and was a proud for all of us. I would like to thank all of you who have been listeners, all my residents who have been working as a team for me, and my family who has given me support all through. Thank you all.